Matthew chapter 6 is where we start. Matthew chapter 18 is where we're going to hang out for the rest of our time. So Matthew 6, Matthew 18. We begin in Matthew chapter 6. Why don't we read this together? Lord's Prayer, the New Living Translation. Let's say it together. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Ah, we put the brakes on. We'll go back one, one verse. This is where we pause today. You're like, but there's more to the prayer. Yes, come back next week. We'll address that part of the prayer. But today, we're pumping the brakes, turning on the caution lights, pulling the side, car over to the side of the road and saying, we've got to sit for a moment about the connection between the forgiveness of our sins and forgiving other people around us. We're just gonna wrestle with that. And it's interesting that as Jesus goes through and he's been modeling this prayer of how we can ask for God's name to be hallowed and his kingdom come and his will to be done and all those things. And then we turned last week to our physical needs of daily bread. It's almost as if Jesus doesn't even pause for a breath. He says, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins. That in some way, our need for daily bread and our need for forgiveness are on the same level. That it's not enough to just receive daily bread. That there's something more to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that's found in the concept of forgiveness. So the question that rings in my mind, I'm sure it's ringing in yours, is what is the nature of forgiveness? How does it connect to prayer? And by the way, like, how much should I forgive? Because there's been some people that have wronged me. There have been some people that have, have done some things. How often should I forgive? Well, the beautiful thing about scripture is that if we have a question that the particular text doesn't address, there's probably someplace else in scripture that does. Scripture corroborates its voice. That's why we study the entire book. And there's this guy by the name of Peter. He's one of the disciples of Jesus. I don't know if you've heard of Peter before. He's the one that has no filter between here and here. And in fact, his, he, he speaks before he thinks, right? And we poke fun at him a little bit, like, Peter, yep, you stuck your foot in your mouth again. But get this, I'm thankful for Peter because Peter asked the questions that we're all thinking. And he asks it when we're unwilling to ask it, right? We get to kind of play on his curtails a little bit. So Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Jesus has been talking about forgiveness. It says, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No. Not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Seven times, Jesus, right? That, that feels like I'm overextending grace a little bit, right? I was gonna say six, but just out of the kindness of my heart, seven times, because that's a perfect number, right, Jesus? And when Jesus is faced with the question, how often should we forgive? Basically, his answer is this. How often should we forgive? Yes. That's how often we should forgive. Yes. Always, every time it comes around. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How, how do we understand that? Yes, yes, we are called to forgive. And Jesus hyperbolizes his answer and says, not seven times, I'll raise you one. Multiply 70 times, seven times. Now you do the math and you're like, oh, this is the amount of times that we should forgive. That's not what Jesus is getting at. Jesus is saying, you think you should forgive seven times and then you need to forgive another. And you think you've done it and then forgiven another. You think you've done it, forgiven another, forgiven another, forgiven another. Because here's the thing, forgiveness is an assumed reality in the kingdom of God. That to be a follower of Jesus, just as prayer is integral to being a follower of Jesus, forgiveness is the same. Jesus doesn't mix words when he talks about forgiveness. And we're gonna look at a story in a moment where that is just the case. Jesus forgives that, Jesus assumes that forgiveness is a part of the kingdom reality. And he teaches his disciples to forgive again and again and again. And to illustrate this, he tells a story. It's in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, just the next verse. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors had brought, had brought in one of the, oh, his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. And we can adjust for inflation today and just say it's billions of dollars, okay? That was an attempt to be funny. He couldn't pay, inflation's not funny, I know, it's, it's painful. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed to pay the debt. 
But the man fell down before his master and begged, please be patient with me and I will pay it. I will pay it all. Let that language sink into your head for a moment. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. A simple story. We're not told how this individual has come to amass this amount of debt. Uh, He's borrowing a lot. Gets to a point where the king is like, you've got to pay for it. It doesn't really matter how he got into the situation. What matters is that his debt is basically unpayable. That no matter how much he works through the rest of his life, he will always be in debt to this king. And so the only way the king can think to rectify it is to say, I'm going to sell you and your wife and your kids and everything you own. So that for the rest of your life, you will work to pay off this debt and it will satisfy the debt that you have incurred. In face with his life in slavery and his family and losing everything, he says, whoa, hold on. Would you please be patient with me? As if the king has not already been patient with him, right? I'll pay the debt. I'll pay the debt. And the king says, okay, I'll have have mercy on you. Count it as paid. You are free to go. You are absolved of the debt. He realized that in his moment of need, the only thing he could do was call out. And we find ourselves in the same debt often. Hopefully not one of material, but certainly one that is spiritual. That we are sinners We live in a sinful world and sin is what separates us from God and the access we have to God is through forgiveness and no matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, you cannot save yourself. You have incurred an unpayable debt. Even more than incurred, you have inherited an unpayable debt. One that you could spend the rest of your life working towards and never see the fruits of your labor. You can't save yourself. So what we do when we recognize our great need is we turn to someone who can do something about it. King, would you give me a little bit of, would you be patient with me? I can repay the debt. Remember, excuse me, I remember a couple years ago, we, uh, uh, we just moved to Keene, first time homeowners, uh, and all the excitement and uh, all the challenges that comes with that, right? And uh, it was a couple months in, and one of those storms popped up. You know the kind, not the one that blows through the town uh, just kind of for a couple of hours and it rains a little bit and then the sun comes out and it's like, oh, did we even have a storm? No, one of those Texas storms that comes around every five years or so where it just rains and it rains and it rains and it rains and the duck pond has turned into just this flowing river, right? Well, one of those storms occurred and I woke up one morning with the rain coming down on 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 the roof and Melissa was getting up to go to work, and I'd go into one section of our house, and I realize that a particular place where water is not supposed to be, water has become to accumulate, and it's coming in quicker than I can really think about what to do about. So I, she goes off to work, I race in, I grab some towels. I think maybe we can cl- you know, clean this up and abate it and just pray for God to stop the rain. And I go through one towel, and I go through another, and I go through another, and I go through another, and I realize that throwing towels at this is not going to, it's not going to fix the problem. So then I start to think, it's like, can I bucket this out of here? Can I get a pump? And I opt with just a broom. I'm like, let me just broom this water out. There's an outside door where the water was coming in. It's like, let me just broom this water out. And out, like four or five hours go by that I'm just working as hard as I can to keep this water out. Mind you, it's raining and raining and raining and raining outside. And it felt a little bit like being on a sinking ship and all you had to bail water was like this little cup. And as much as you throw out, 10 times comes in and you're just, you know, working, 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 working hard. And I got to the point that I realized there was literally, I tried everything I could think of. There was nothing I could do to fix the situation. And it was probably a good time to call my dad, right? When you realize that you've done all that you can do, call dad. Dad can fix anything. He's at least got the experience about it. I call him, you know, vo- adrenaline pumping, and he knows something's up. He's like, what's wrong? I was like, Dad, I need your help. Got water where water is not supposed to be. Can you help me? Can you help me fix this? So he kind of says, give me a second. I'm going to pick up this. I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that, and I'm going to come over, and I'm going to help you. And the rest of the day, we worked together to try to shore up where the water was coming in, get the rest of the water out so that it wouldn't damage the rest of the house. When we recognize our great need, that is where 
we have a willingness for help to come and to provide. And the same is true for forgiveness. Forgiveness begins with recognizing our need for grace that I have an unpayable debt, that I've got something on my hands that I cannot deal with. God, I need some grace. God, I need some grace in my life. Back to the prayer for a moment, Matthew 6, verse 12. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. It's not just enough to recognize our need and ask God for forgiveness. In turn, Jesus says, forgive those who sin against you. And in case we miss it, he will reiterate this point twice in two verses. Just, just skip down a couple verses with me. Matthew chapter six, verses 14 and 15. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Mm. That's a heavy passage. Because we like to think about God as the forgiving God, the one who cares, the one who provides, all those, all those in our mind. But this passage says, if we do not forgive people around us, then our Father in heaven will not forgive us. How do we comprehend this? How do we understand? D.A. Carson in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, page 175, puts it this way. The repetition, the one that we just read, serves to stress the deep importance for the community of disciples, that's you and me, to be a forgiving community if its prayers are to be effective. In other words, when you pray for forgiveness for yourself, it must do something for the people around you or it will do nothing. But as we receive forgiveness from God, it propels us to forgive those around us. And the story continues, Matthew 18, verse 28. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars and said, your debts are forgiven, I've been forgiven much, go in peace. Does your Bible read that way? No. It says that he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. He's got him up against the wall and he says, your life or the money, buddy. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Notice what he says. Be patient with me. I will pay it. Does this sound familiar? It's exactly what this guy had said to, to the king. But his creditor, the one who had been forgiven much, wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in a man, the man he had forgiven, and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Shouldn't the forgiveness that I extended towards you also be extended to the ones that are in debt towards you? Because it was a little thing. I forgave you much and you're going after pennies? What's up with this? The forgiveness extended to this man did not transform his heart. He said, ha, I got out scot-free. Now I can go collect some money and I'll be on my way. And here's what happens to him, Matthew 18, verses 34 and 35. Then the anger king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then Jesus, commenting on this story, says this, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to give your brothers and sisters, to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Ouch. That's some serious language. Jesus says, your father in heaven will treat you the same way you treated this man if you are unwilling to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. The forgiveness that you have received, it has not transformed your heart. God's gonna treat you the same way because the reality is that forgiveness experienced must be forgiveness shared or we have not truly experienced it. Forgiveness experienced must be forgiveness shared. That as you receive forgiveness from God, it does something inside of you that then enables you and empowers you to forgive those around you. Because remember in the, in the story, he's going after a fellow servant, not a position that's underneath him or somebody above him. They are on equal ground and the king has forgiven him much and he goes after a brother and sister and says, you owe me much. The same is true in our lives. Michael Green puts it this way in the message of Matthew commentary 101. For if we are, if we are open, if we are to open our hands to receive his gracious pardon, 
We cannot keep our fists tightly clenched against those who have wronged us. To pray the prayer, Lord, forgive us, but just unleash everything on my neighbor. I have an unforgiving spirit against them. Is to think we're reaching out to God with an open palm to receive a blessing, but it's really a closed fist. And we have no apparatus to receive the blessing of God until we are willing to let the fist drop and to open our hand and say, Father, forgive, and then help me forgive those around us. And we open-handedly receive the blessing of God and pass the blessing of God on to the people around us. Through prayer, we are empowered to carry forgiveness to others. We cannot accept the forgiveness of God and hold resentment against our brother and our sister. But you carry burdens. You've been wronged. I've been wronged. There are things that have happened into, in our lives that we do not repeat, that maybe only a few people know, and maybe only you and God and that other person know. That you've been abused or, or mistreated in a way that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. And there's something that's happened to you. You're like, I can't think in the world about how I would forgive someone like that. How could I possibly extend forgiveness? Our passage, one more time, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Forgive our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Notice who is handling what in this passage. God is the one who forgives sins. We are called to forgive people. There are outcomes in our life and circumstances in our lives that we do not have control over. That sin is infested and has been festering in our hearts and the hearts of our, our neighbors and our friends and our enemies. God says, I'm not calling you to forgive that. I'm not calling you to bring the answer to sin. I'm going to deal with the mess. What I'm asking you to do is walk with people through the mess. I'll take care of the sin. I'm asking you to forgive people. Don't hold what they've done against them. Now, I'm not advocating for an absolution of consequences. I'm not advocating for you to invite your abuser back into your life. But what I am saying is that there are real consequences for when we're wronged and we wrong others. And when we extend forgiveness, or perhaps said a better way, we'll back up. When we withhold forgiveness, when we harbor resentment in our hearts towards other people, and we bear down on the wrongs that have been done to us, and we poke at it, and we say, you're the reason this, you're the reason that, I can't love because of this, I can't love because of that. Really what we're doing is we're harboring something inside of us that will ultimately kill us. We're eating the rat poison and expecting somebody else to die. And we sit up at our table and pour it out and we're like, mm. it's killing us on the inside. We're carrying burdens that we're not meant to carry. When we hold that resentment and anger and frustration, we're holding that against the other person and expecting something to happen. When God says, would you let me take care of the consequences? All I've asked you to do is extend forgiveness. Would you extend forgiveness to that person in your life? Because if we don't, the anger and the frustration and the ill will towards others will ultimately bring our own demise. Because forgiveness is about transformation. It's about transformation of your heart and about my heart. Ellen White puts it this way in the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 114. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. That's what forgiveness is all about. It's the transformation of the heart. It's your heart and it's my heart. This particular topic is near and dear to myself and, and to our family. Some of you know of the tragedy that struck my wife, Melissa's family, a number of years ago. Early 2000s, she's a little girl, eight or nine years old, Traveled with her family to serve as missionaries in the little island of Palau. And if you were to take a pin and put it on the map and say that's where Palau is, Palau gets covered by the pin. It just ceases to exist under that pin. They were set to be there five, six, seven years, something like that. 
And about a year and a half into their experience, beloved by the community, serving God, a couple of days before Christmas, someone broke into their home, took the life of Melissa's parents and her brother, and then left her beside the road for dead. Tragedy. Someone's life. They figure out who did it. They find her, they find the guy. He's the guy that did it, sentence him to life. The state, the nation, hosts a national funeral. Three caskets in this gymnasium, whole nation watching gathered around. The program goes through, family had traveled in, and get down to the end of the program, you expect the dismissal and everything out. Melissa's grandmother steps up. She lost her son. Melissa's grandmother steps up to the stage and everybody's wondering what in the world's gonna, what's gonna happen. She goes to the mic and she says these words, I'm wondering if the mother of the murderer is here this afternoon. His name was Justin. It's Justin's mom here. Invites her up. She's there, invites her up. Comes and stands beside her. And Melissa's grandmother, Ruth, Ruth the Piva, some of you, some of you uh, may know her, a member of this community, puts her arm around her and says these words, we are two mothers grieving lost sons. Do not hold Justin's actions against her or her family or against Justin. We forgive you. And let me tell you, in an honor and shame culture, those words were like a bath of cold water that covered the entire nation. In that culture, in Palau, if you do something or somebody in your family does something to somebody else, you hold that against them for their entire life. It brings shame on the family and you're reminded day after day of the wrong action committed against someone. We forgive you. We can't go back and undo the wrong, but we forgive you. Fast forward about 15 years, Melissa and I are married at this point. We had the chance to, we were invited to go back to Palau. It'd be the first time that she'd go back. She would share that one day I want to come back to Palau. I want to come back, have the opportunity to do so. While we're there, those of you subscribed to the church newsletter, read the little story yesterday I shared of our experience in the ocean. Got to see the beauty of, of Palau, one of the most renowned dive spots in the world. More importantly, we got to connect with people, some of the most lovely people in the world. And while we're there, one of the leaders pulls Melissa aside and says, hey, do you, do you want to see Justin? She's taken a little bit back. Doesn't know how to respond to that. It's been many years, forgiveness extended, healing, but now, again, the opportunity to face face the murderer who the last time she saw him was in a courtroom saying, yeah, that's the guy. What would you do? We talked about it, gathered as a family, prayed over it, we had grandparents there and uh, support group and local pastors and just people surrounded. And we spent about two hours talking about this. What are we going to do? And the decision is made. Let's go see Justin. So we go. Jail is ironically about a block away from the church, just across the, the other side of the street. We're escorted over there. Walk into this meeting room, plastic folding tables, you know, the kind And there he stands, Justin, with a guard next to him. And we as a family sit on the other side of the table and we sit down. And he shares some words of of remorse and and sorrow and what God has been doing in his life. Family begins to to speak and to address. We kind of go down the line. It gets to the point that Melissa has the opportunity to speak. Local pastor says, Melissa, do you you, want to say anything? She didn't have anything planned, but here are the words that come out of her mouth through tears. She says, we are no better than you, talking to Justin. We're no better than you. Can't go back and fix the past. I'm not gonna wallow in, what, 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 in, in harboring resentment against you. And one day, I look forward to the day that Jesus calls my parents and my brother home, and me too, and I look forward to you being there as well. one of the most powerful moments in my life where I felt the Holy Spirit the most, just God's hand over that room, thick and heavy. Forgiveness extended. Transformation happened. Healing happened. It doesn't fix the past. It doesn't right the wrong. There are consequences for the wrong. But what it does is it releases us 
from the poison of resentment that will kill us in our lifetime. I'm always amazed at the courage Melissa has in her family that though tragedy struck to respond in such a forgiving way. And I can only think about some words that a man said about 2,000 years ago as he's hanging on an instrument of execution. In Luke 23, verse 34, with the weight of the sin on the world and those who were killing him in front of him, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus, with the weight of your sin and my sin and the entire world on his shoulders, extends forgiveness to those who killed him. How much more then do we have the opportunity to extend forgiveness? Richard Foster in his book on prayer puts it this way. We who follow Jesus Christ have been given the gracious ministry of bringing God's forgiveness to one another. Every single time we extend forgiveness, we participate in the gospel. The good, good news that says your unpayable debt has been taken care of, signed, sealed, and delivered. Can I share just a little bit of you, the wrong that you've done against me pales in comparison to the debt that I owe to the creator of all things. He's taken care of my debt. Can I take care of yours? And we'll figure out a way to walk through the mess in the in-between. The reason we can forgive is because God has forgiven much. And the reason that Jesus connects forgiveness to prayer is so that when in our heart we've got some things to work out, we wrestle through recognizing, God, you've forgiven much. Would you forgive me? Now, would you help me forgive those around me? Thank you for taking care of my unpayable debt. May I forgive the payable debts that are incurred here on this earth. This forgiveness is at the heart of the character of God. Micah, one of my new favorite books of the Bible for some odd reason. Micah chapter 7 verses 18 through 20 read this way. Where is another God like you? who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sin of his special people. You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. You will show us your faithfulness and unfailing love as you promised to our ancestors, Abraham and Jacob, long ago. Forgiveness is at the heart of who God is. And every time we extend forgiveness to those around us, we participate in the saving grace of the gospel. Let God take care of the details. Let God take care of the debt, but release that person from owing you anything. I think our world would be better for it. And as this week, you, 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 you pray the prayer, I know you're going to be, Father, forgive me as I forgive others. That little prayer, that one little line, may it cause an awakening in your heart that you walk from this place today, realizing the resentment that you may carry, that we might carry for someone. Say, God, forgive me as I go and forgive my brother or my sister. May that be your little prayer. Thanks for stopping by. I hope and pray that this message was a blessing for you. If you'd like to see more content like this, we need your help. You can support the Keene Seventh Adventist Church media ministry by going to AdventistGiving.org, finding the Keene Seventh Adventist Church in Texas, and then putting in your donation to the media line. Your faithful giving and support allows us to spread the gospel online for you and others to participate in. Thank you for your continued support of the Keene Seventh Adventist Church.